Today we're going to be talking about a separation known as liquid-liquid extraction. Now this is a separation approach that takes advantage of the relative solubilities of a particular solute in two different liquid phases. Most commonly uh, it's you're extracting material either from the organic to the aqueous phase or vice versa. Now <clears throat> so far we've been talking about uh, distillation as one of the primary means of separation or, or flash calculation. But distillation is very energy intensive. And in fact it is estimated that about 3% of the world's energy goes into distillation and also about 20 to 40 percent of all the energy consumed in a chemical plant. Consequently there's a lot of interest in using different types of separation that are less energy intensive. In addition to liquid-liquid extraction this could be membranes or some sort of a sorbent where molecules would dissolve on a substrate and then they would be further you know, separated in a different process. So liquid-liquid extraction, uh, the thermodynamics of it is something that we're not going to be focusing too much on, uh, but generally it is a three component system, and I'll write this as LLE for liquid-liquid extraction or also liquid-liquid equilibrium. And typically how this works is it takes advantage of a three component system where one solute may be preferentially dissolved in one phase or the other. So this is generally three components. Now I'll just call them in most instances A, B, and C, and charting and diagrams will also represent that. If for example we have A is equal to toluene, B is equal to benzene, or C is equal to xylene, these are all similar compounds. And as such, they form one phase. In this case, we can't really use a liquid-liquid separation to extract something. So liquid-liquid extraction is harder to design, so it's less frequently used, whereas distillation or flash separation is really a brute force type attack. However, if we have a system where A is equal to ethanol, B is equal to water, and C is equal to benzene, we see we have three different classes of molecules in the case here. Ethanol is here, we've got water, and then we have benzene as an aromatic organic. So in between ethanol and water, it is miscible. And in terms of definitions, this means they dissolve in one another. ethanol and benzene are also miscible. Ethanol is organic and polar. Water is polar and benzene is organic and nonpolar. So as such we see we have a complex thermodynamic mixture here of ethanol, water, and benzene, whereas one may dissolve in the other and not so much in the other one. And it is a complex system. Now there are a couple of approaches that we can use to 
uh, attempt to figure out how this goes about. The first one is to use what they call a partition ratio or a partition coefficient. And this is called K, and I know we use K quite a bit, um, but K is a common term used for thermodynamic separation variables. It is defined as the mass fraction of component one in phase one. We'll talk a little bit more about what this means, divided by the mass fraction of the same component in phase two. So if the, if the uh, component that we're trying to separate, if liquid number one is better dissolved in phase one, so we can say more soluble in phase one, then this K should be greater than one because there'll be more of material in this one than in this one, so you have a large number divided by a small number, which means it'll be greater than one. So as an example of a chemical process that would take advantage of this, you would have A and B potentially entering in the top column. You could have component C entering in the bottom. We'll draw our black box for our liquid-liquid separator or liquid-liquid extractor. Coming out of the top, we would have A and B, and we would have B and C. We can call this one phase two, and this one phase one. And in this particular instance, A and C are immiscible, or they don't mix. Mathematically, we would write Kb as equal to the mass fraction of component one in phase one. In this case, component one would be component B, or divided by the mass fraction of component one in phase two. So we would write this as Xb as the mass fraction in phase one, divided by Xb phase two. And the superscripts denote here that it is which phase it is in. Furthermore, we can write this by approximating, by substituting in the definition of the mass fraction, we would have Mb in phase one divided by Ma phase one plus Mb phase one divided by Mb phase two divided by Mb phase two plus MC phase two. So this approach, it adds an equation uh, to help solve the, the material balance. An alternate approach to balancing a liquid-liquid equilibrium problem is to use a triangle diagram. And it is a triangle diagram because we see it is a triangle with three sides. The first thing we'll need to go over is how to actually read a tri triangle diagram before we go about the difficulty of trying to apply it for a particular liquid-liquid uh, extraction process. The first thing to notice about the triangle diagram is that we have three, our three components listed at the 
primary axes of the triangle diagram. And then we have a series of numbers uh, which basically count down away from each of those numbers. So if I were to draw a particular point here, this corner is pure A. Similarly over here, this is pure B, and here is pure C. As we march away um, in between, let's say for example, these two sides, this is a mixture of A and C. So if I were to put a data point right here, this would correspond to 70% A and 30% C. Now I know that because we have the 70% marching over here for the A, and for the C we have this 30% here counting down from the pure. Similarly, on this side over here, it is C and B only, and on this side over here, it is A and C only. Now, somewhere in the middle of the diagram, let's choose a color that looks a bit different. In the middle of the diagram, if we were to choose some arbitrary point right here, we can read that it is 50% B, Reading the lines for C, looking down here, we find that it is 30% C, and ultimately it is then 20% A. We add this all together, we get 100%, which is good. Now some additional features of the triangle diagram, in addition to uh, reading it in terms of the position. Uh, this diagram here actually doesn't have any experimental data on it, so it doesn't really help us do much of anything. Now if we look at this other triangle diagram with actual experimental data, I'll point out that this line right here, this is the phase boundary. Up here, this is one phase. So if I were to choose this data point right here, which would be, I'll call it uh, I, I corresponds to 60% C, let's see, this is 20% B, and the rest should be A, which looks like it is 20%. If I were to make this mixture in the laboratory, it would be one phase, so if I were to draw this is like a laboratory beaker with a little pore spout there, it would be just one homogeneous liquid. Now, if I were to choose a data point, let's say over in this direction, in fact, let's choose a, a different color to make it distinct, choose this data point right here, we'll call this one mixture II. In mixture II, we have a composition of 20% C, and 50% A, and the B composition is 30%. Again, adds up to 100%. This would form a two-phase system. So this region underneath the yellow curve right here, this is the two-phase region, meaning it separates into two different phases. So if I were to have a beaker in the laboratory, there would be two distinct phases. One that could be likely an aqueous phase, and another one that would, sorry, this would be, for example, this would be water, because it is more dense, and then this could be some sort of organic, which would be less dense than water, so it would float on the top. On this phase diagram here, so once we're in the two-phase region, this single data point really can't describe the whole system. These lines right here, 
These are called tie lines. And they lead us to these boundaries of the triangle diagram. Up here there's going to be some point that's not marked on the plot, but essentially this curved line right here would be phase one composition and over here we would have phase two composition. So taking this data point right here, that is our starting point, we can then kind of trace it over here and trace this one over here, uh, noting to be parallel to these lines or trying to do the best job you can to be in the middle of it. Our phase two composition in this arbitrary configuration that I have drawn would be approximately, let's say, 94% a, and we would be about 8% C, and over here for B, we would be oh, approximately 6 or so, oh sorry, this is 84% A, and 8%. Okay, and then we would trace this over here to this point uh, here. This would be phase one. And its composition in A would be about 13% A. In B, it would be 90, 80, 70, 60, about 52, 52% B. We add these together, that'll be 65, so that should be 35% C, and let's confirm. And indeed, we are about halfway in between the 30 and 40 lines there. This is how we would read a triangle diagram. Just like in a TXY and PXY diagram, uh, this plot tells us more than just the composition of phase one and of phase two. The rel If we are on the same tie line in between phase one and phase two, the closer we get over here potentially to phase one means the more phase one we have and the closer we would get over here to phase two would tell us how much of phase two we have in the system. One final comment on the triangle diagram is if we look at the line connecting A and C we find that it is contained entirely within the one phase region which indicates that A and C are missable. Likewise, in between B and C are missable. But if we look at A and B, we find that we are partly in the one phase region, partly in the two phase region, and in the one phase region again. So in these circumstances here, they are A and B are partially missable. And we can only form very dilute mixtures of, in this case here, we have a small amount of B in A, and over here we have a small amount of A in B. So in this case here we have A in B and over here we have B in A. But again, this is only a very small amount. So for example, a small amount of this was the, if this was the water, benzene, ethanol system, we see that uh, water and ethanol are fully miscible. Ethanol and benzene are fully miscible. Now I don't know if this is exactly the case. This is just the made up uh, example, um, but if we had A and B, they're largely immiscible, except we can dissolve a small amount of B, in this case benzene, in A water, or we can dissolve a very small amount of water in the benzene itself.